Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. We have started on a sermon series entitled, The Life of Paul. By the time many of you are done with the epistles of Paul and the life of Paul or the Pauline series, you will not have any question about the grace. You will just get inside and just well, and let God work in your life. Hallelujah. I started by describing the life of Paul from the time he was born, a born of Tarsus in the city of Cilicia, of no mean city, the scriptures speak, likened to the nature and time and power and sovereignty of places like Athens and Alexandria. I explained to you of how he was born in diaspora by a Pharisee father and how he was raised in the line and culture of the Greek people and the doctrine and lines of affiliation of the cultures of the Greek people by the mind of Alexander and the wise men of the other lines, the likes of the Socrates, Leto, you mentioned, those guys even come way later and after, but the, the mind of the Greek culture because their cosmopolitan idea was the moment you take over a people, if they don't adopt your language, your philosophy, you don't have them. So teach them your philosophy, teach them your language, teach them your culture. If they should have a religious affiliation, let it have certain nuggets of your schools of thought and let Greek culture dominate over every religious affair. If it means for you to raise a certain line of sect in them or if the sect should come up, remunerate the sect. Identify them. Give them some respect and honor them. And that's how the sects are also raised in that line. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Ethan, and you see how much authority they have towards Caesar. They report cases and Pilate listens. They report cases and Caesar listens. Why? Because there's a certain system that has to draw them in sects. And those that are respected to have a certain life of high authority. What happens is the government of the Greek people, the Romans, gives them a certain place of attention, so to speak. Make them rich. Let them eat by your hand. That's the principle. You understand? Now, we begin at the lines of conversions of Paul. So you imagine a boy raised in diaspora, okay, under Pharisee parents who have a certain zeal, even though the culture in Cilicia has very many dictates of the Greek language and uh, the Greek culture, including the language, the cosmopolitan line, the philosophies, the schools of thought, their ideas of religion, how Zeus and <laughs> And Jupiter the same, you understand? And he is raised in a place where the father is a Pharisee. And the father has a zeal for his son to also be a Pharisee. What does he do? He sponsors him to the best Bible school in the world under the seat of the most prominent lawyer. Then the Bible calls him Gamaliel. And the Bible says that he went to sit under Gamaliel. He sat under the feet of the best lawyer that was known in the land of Jerusalem. Why? Because the man wanted his son to know God. Tell your neighbor, the man wanted his son to know God. So, Paul is raised in the lines of Gamaliel, he starts to know the law. Now, Paul was not only a Pharisee, but he was among the land Pharisees. You understand? He was among the land Pharisees. He was not just a Pharisee. He was a land Pharisee. He knew the law to the letter. He knew the laws, plural, to the letter. He knew the Levitical, he knew the oral laws, he knew the lines, the outside laws, and the Pharisees also had a certain line where they could even create other ordinances the so-called wise men of the scribes. They used to create certain ordinances around the laws of Moses for them to have what they called government. Paul was a Jew of the Jews. He tells you very well of the Philippian line. He says, though I might also have confidence, listen to Paul, eh? in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh, I am That means if you want any results in the flesh, I have them. Okay? Next slide. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew 
of the Hebrews are starting the law, I was a Pharisee. If you want to know anything called the law, Pharisee. You understand? Next line. Concerning the zeal, I was persecuting the church and touching the righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. Now, if Paul, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, don't steal, don't kill, he was blameless. That means he never used to kill, steal. He was 100%. Why did he need God? Why did he get born again? Because there was a line of righteousness that was different from the law. Next line. But what things were gained for me, these I counted loss for Christ. Are you hearing me? Those were what were gained for me. It was important for Paul to be 100% pure in the law. But he got to a certain point and that was useless. It was not gained to him. Next line. Uh-huh. Yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but damn that I may win Christ. He suffered the loss of all things because he was seeking for a line of excellence. He did have knowledge, he had knowledge. But he counted all that knowledge but damn for the excellence of knowledge. Now, I want to open your eyes to what Paul called excellent knowledge. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Paul's conversion. Tell your neighbor Paul's conversion. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 9 verse 1. And so, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went up unto the high priest. Okay? Next line. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of his way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You see, the caste system of the Pharisees and the priests had a certain authority and line to bring certain people to books. And many of the priests were actually Sadducee lines. Not Pharisee lines, but they were Sadducee lines. And the Sadducees had authority to write certain things to bring certain people to book. You see where I'm coming from? To bring certain people to book. You understand? That if they be found any of these way, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Okay? Give me the message version of that. I want you to see the picture, the scripture there. Uh-huh. And God arrest warrants. He went to the priest to get arrest warrant to take to the meeting places in Damascus so that if he found anyone there belonging to the way. You see, who is the way? You see, he was looking for anybody belonging to the way, whether men or women, they could arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. Okay? Next line. Uh-huh. He set off. And when he got to the outskirts of Damascus, he was suddenly dazed by a blinding flash of light. Next line. He fell to the earth and had a voice saying unto him, so, so, why? Persecute thou me. Why are you persecuting me? Okay? And the Bible says, next line, and he said, Who art thou, my Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the priests. Okay? Next line. And he tree trembling, this is Paul, so, and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Next line. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. That means he became blind. But they led him by the hand and brought him into the Damascus. Look at those Christians. He's persecuting them, okay? But the moment the guy becomes blind, they lead him to Damascus. Are we together? Let's continue. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. God got a vision and said. Oh, I'm saying He got a vision and said to the guy. Okay? Said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. Next line. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed and had seen a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive sight, okay? God comes to this guy and gives him a vision, okay? And in the vision, the Lord is telling him there is a guy praying in the house of Judas. He's called who? So. But as he's praying, the Lord has given him a very clear-cut vision. This is the Lord giving who? Saul a vision. That there is a man called Ananias is coming and he's putting his hand on you that he might receive sight. Are we together? Next slide. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. 
And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call thy name. Next line. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. Okay, he's funny, but he's chosen. But I, you know, there, there is something about... <laughs> I wish some people first understand this concept. Eh? It doesn't matter how funny a man is. He's a chosen vessel. The same people who can't believe it. You didn't choose yourself. You're a chosen vessel. You understand? And he tells him, uh-huh. For he's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles. That's why he was born in diaspora. And kings and the children of Israel, me. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Okay, next line. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, putting his hand on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath set me that thou mightest receive thy inside and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You understand? And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight from wheat and arose and was baptized, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. What happened after the incident? Then saw certain days with then was saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. What did he do? The moment he's translated, he stays in Damascus. You understand where I'm coming from? So he's born again, but with the Damascus Christians. Give me the message version of that. Uh -huh. And sat down with them to a hearty meal. So spent a few days getting acquainted with the Damascus disciples. That's what I was looking for. He did not just dwell with them. He took some time to understand what do the disciples in Damascus know? What do the guys who have been at Damascus know? Okay? Next line. Let's continue the message. But when tried to work. So when Paul is translated, what does he do? He goes direct to wasting no time. What was he doing? Preaching in the meeting places that Jesus was the Son of God. What was Paul's first message? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. You understand? Next line. They were caught off guard by this and not all sure that they could trust him. They kept saying, huh, isn't this guy, isn't this the man who wrecked havoc in Jerusalem among the believers? And did he come here to do the same thing? Arrest us and drag us off to jail in Jerusalem for sentencing by the high priests. Next line. But their suspicions didn't slow Saul down from even this minute. His momentum was up and about and he plowed straight into the opposition, disarming the Damascus Jews and trying to show them that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, the first revelation that ever hit Paul's spirit was not the grace message. It was Jesus is the Son of the Lord. He is the Son of God. Okay? Oh, so to speak. Jesus, the Son of God, or the Messiah, was the first definition for Paul to hit his spirit. You understand? Because Jesus is the grace message. But that was the beginning of understanding grace. The Messiah is come. Remember, this message is hitting a man who has been raised in the Hellenistic school of thought that has given men the impression that if you're worshipping Zeus and the other one is so, uh, uh, worshipping the other God, we all worship the same God. They are under a different name. The Hellenists believe that way. The Grecians believe that way. That probably yours is Allah, mine is Yesu, his is that, but oh, it's the same God. You understand? And we don't believe that. I don't have the same God with Allah. You get what I'm trying to tell you? I do not have. My Jesus is different from Allah. Whether we debate or we don't debate, my God is different from their God. My God, and I'll be clear, is different from the Roman Catholic. Because the Roman Catholic can neither marry, I don't need Mary to get to Christ. It's is clear. Cut. No negotiation. No nothing. In love and respect. Now, this man is Hellenist. Remember, for those of you who are here on Sunday, he, they believe that Moses is the last disciple. They don't believe that the Messiah has come. And this guy comes and conversion hits his face. Scales fall off. And then he has tells him, you're going to suffer for, for God. He lays hands on a guy. He's baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with tongues. He remembers the voice that called upon him. And asked him, why dost thou persecute me? For this is Jesus. He just, listen. Paul never saw Jesus in the body. You understand? But when Jesus said, why dost thou persecutest me? And he's remembering that he has persecuted people. It was enough understanding that this man must have come in the flesh. How come they are walking and he is claiming their body? Chimaya. How come he, why dost thou persecutest me? He never saw Jesus in the body, but he was very sure. You understand? That he was persecuting folk. 
whom Jesus claims to be him. Already, he understands the concept of God in the body. You understand? And for those of you who read timelines, that was about 37 AD. You understand? Jesus had gone about 32 AD. That's about five years, you know? And Paul is on the mix about 37 AD. And during that time, of course, the Israelite children were still under Roman rule. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The emperor Tiberius Caesar had just died. Hallelujah. Now, as he gets this conversion line, he just now believes this one thing. As a Jewish, I believed Moses was the only line of thought. I have followed the laws of Moses. I've followed the principles of Moses. I've followed the Leviticus. I've followed everything to the letter of Moses. Now I realize there is a man wiser who came after Moses. You understand? Now, I want to draw for you a few groups of people. Okay? Group A, Hellenists, believers, alone. Coupled with group B, Hellenist believers who are Judaistic. Okay? And remember, Judaism always influenced Hellenism, and Hellenism always influenced Judaism because they were all under Roman rule. Are you hearing me? Then there's a group of folk in Damascus who have just gotten born again. Okay? And what is their message? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. They're doing miracles. Jesus is the Messiah. They're being persecuted. Jesus is the Messiah. Why are they being persecuted? These men don't believe that Jesus came. They don't believe that he is the, the Messiah walked this earth. They believe in the coming of the Messiah like some of you read in their creed. Okay? So already there is a war of men here, Jerusalem, coming to always look for men who had believed in Damascus to attack them. Paul has crossed over to this line. And he has started the message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what is his message? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. If you guys say Amen. Hallelujah. Now Galatians chapter 1. <laughs> Is going to open your eyes to, to, I'm going to show you a path that takes off, because now I'm trying to follow chronology, okay? I'm trying to follow what? I'm not just trying to follow a line and letter for you to say, ah, it's just keeping spaces. I want to give you time to go and do your research and see when these letters were written. You understand? What were the experiences of these letters? When Paul is speaking in a certain letter, which year was he referring to? Because when you understand there which Paul is referring to, okay, you'll understand, and the concept that we will be using, we will be using the generations, okay? Like I tell you, that Emperor Tiberius had died, and King Aretas was in existence between 39 to about 40 AD. And for about 41, there is another king, because when Paul mentions kings existing or emperors, you of course can connect to each other's emperors. Lead. You get where I'm coming from? You understand what I'm trying to, trying to tell you? Now, we have an experience of Paul in the book of Galatians trying to write to the church of Galatians, but he takes them back a bit to his life. And I also intend to also take you back a bit to his life, if you're okay with it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me begin with the sixth verse. He says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. Paul is speaking that, that now there are two different gospels. Okay? Now, mark you, oh, probably I need to tell you this, that even though there are Hellenist believers and Judaizers that don't believe in the coming of Jesus, there's a group of men eh, who later start to believe in the Messiah, but stayed with a Judistic line. Moses is also important as Christ is. You get where I'm coming from? So they also have a message. Even though Jesus came, Moses is also important. But the question is, to which extent? That's what we're going to discover. Next line. Mm -hmm. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Next line. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that then that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Give me the message version of that. Read. 
Let me be blunt. If any of us, even an angel from heaven, were to preach something other than what we preached originally, let him be a curse. We want to understand what was preached. Okay? Next line. I said it once and I'll say it again. If anyone, regardless of the reputation of credentials, preaches something other than that that you received originally, let him be a curse. Next line. Do you think I speak this strongly in order to manipulate crowds? Or carry favor with God? Or get popular applause? If my goal was popularity, I wouldn't bother being Christ's slave. You understand? Give me the King James from that. For do I now persuade men of God? Or do I seek to please men? For if yet I please men, should I not be the servant of Christ? Next verse, message. But I certify. Okay, he says, there is now, know this, I'm most emphatic here, friends. This great message I delivered unto you is not mere human optimism. I didn't receive it through the traditions, and I wasn't taught it in some school. I got it straight from God. I received the message directly from Jesus Christ. Now, let's differentiate. Hellenism, Judaism. He goes to Damascus, they teach him Jesus is the son of God, but there is something deeper Paul learned. And there is something that he learned, and he claims no man taught him. So he can't say, this I adopted by the brethren at Damascus. Okay, what does the King James say? For neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus. That means more than the Hellenism, Judaism, and the schools of thought of the Damascus Christians that had gotten born again, some of whom still even hold the doctrine of Moses, there was something on Paul that were taught him, not from the brethren of Damascus. You see, Paul is trying to need something in your spirit. Let's continue. For ye have heard of my conversation in past time in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Give me the amplified version of that. Amplified. For you have heard of my earlier career and former manner in the life of the Jewish religion. What is that? Judaism. You know how I was when I was Judas. Okay? How I persecuted and abused the church of God furiously and extensively and with fanatical zeal did my best to make havoc and destroy it. Next line. And you have heard how I outstripped many of the men of my own generation among the people of my race in my advancement in study and observance of the laws of Judaism, so extremely enthusiastic and zealous, and I was for the traditions of my ancestors. You understand? He was not Paul, and that's why I tell people, just go beyond the lines of preaching the gospel with a certain excitement, okay? Get to a line where the gospel in you is just deeper than you speaking what you feel you must speak. But get to a point where in your own generation you supersede certain lines of advancement in knowledge. Know these things, okay? Because the Greeks seek after wisdom and the Jews seek after the signs. If a man wants us to make the lamb walk, we make the lone brother. They will walk. But if a man doesn't want to reason in the line of the lamb and he wants us to advance, okay? Let us be advanced. Are you hearing? Let us speak like we know. You understand? Some of us, we got beyond the place of reading the Bible because a certain man is reading it for us on Saturday or Sunday, on radio and television. You understand? Since for all these years we've been studying, we left the grace message and went back to Old Testament to see whether we were wrong. Are you hearing me? We read Moses and understood the righteousness which is on this wise and speaks of faith. We went to Genesis and we saw why God could not cast in even though she had eaten and waited for Adam. Because he knew there was another Adam who would marry another Eve, and God would not look for that Eve when that Adam is there. <laughs> we became the propitiation, the mediator of the covenant. Now, hey, later on another Adam will come, and Eve will fall, but God will keep quiet. Because his business is not Eve. He has never wanted general confessions. Priests representing many. That's his business. Even in the Old Testament, Aaron just goes there for everyone. New Testament, Melchizedek, Jesus, our forerunner, he goes on behalf of us, ever interceding for us. God's business with men has not always to hear everyone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Look, some people don't understand the concept. They don't understand the concept. Melchizedek does not come with an order to say, everyone go for your own repentance. Hey, <laughs> come on. That's not Melchizedek's line. He has gone in advance for us. The Bible says, He has gone in advance for us. The forerunner. Those immutable things, the Bible says, they are over and the promise. 
just to make sure it does not twist the immutability of his counsel. First of all, you understand it's not about what you think. For him, he has made up his mind. Jesus is the perfect lamb of sacrifice. You understand? You can't do anything more than what that blood did. Think it in your head. My hope is beautiful. You remember those things? Than Jesus' blood and righteousness, how dare you trust us fears? Bad holy, sting Jesus' name, on oh, Christ the sorry, for Christ then, oh, rather proud be. Sinking fast, oh, at the ground we sink. What does the next verse say? When darkness stood to hide his pain, I rest. Not yours. In every island. Stormy care, my anchor. Oh, not outside the veil. Oh, Christ the solid rock. Oh, I do ground it. Oh, I do ground I'm looking for a certain verse. Ah, that's it. He's of his core, then and his blood support me. Oh, and in blood, when all around my glory, he says, Oh, my hope, oh, Christ. Any other ground, any other ground is sinking sand. Anything besides Jesus Christ is sinking sand. I don't care how straight it looks, I don't care how morally upright it is, if it ain't Christ. Paul is saying, you saw my judistic line. Huh? Next slide. He says, how I persecuted and abused the church of God, furiously and extensively, with fanatic zeal and did my best to make havoc and destroy it. Next slide. And you have heard how I outstripped many of the men of my own generation among the people of my race in my advancement, in study and observance of the laws of the Judaism. So extremely enthusiastic and zealous. I was for the traditions of my father. Give me the message of that. I was so enthusiastic about the traditions of my ancestors that I advanced head and shoulders above my peers in my career. Paul, you're speaking of a boy who was smart in the law. You understand? Let's continue. Let's continue. Even then, God had designs on me. Why? When I was still in my mother's womb, he chose and called me out of sheer generosity. You understand what does the Amplified Bible say? Ah, amplified. Next slide. But when he who had chosen and set me apart even before I was born had called me by his grace, his grace, his undeserved favor and blessing. That's why when a man says grace is not complete except you do something. Before you were born, this guy died for you. What could you do? Listen, Jesus died before even your mother and father met. What more can you add? What did you add there? Okay? And his undeserved favor and blessing so fit and was pleased. Next slide. To reveal and unveil and disclose his son within me so that I might proclaim to him among the Gentiles the non-Jewish world. Are you hearing me? Let's put a fourth class of people here called non-Jewish. Hellenists, Judists, but they are one and the same. Damascus, Christians, and a few who are legal. And then there are also these Gentiles who don't know nothing. Okay? Come here, brother. To reveal to the non-Jewish world as the glad tidings gospel immediately he says i did not confer with flesh and blood are you hearing me 
and did not consult or counsel with any frail human being or communicate with anyone. Okay? Just give me the King James. Uh -huh. To reveal his son in me that I might reprise him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Uh -huh. Now he was intervened and revealed his son to me so that I might joyfully tell non Jews about him immediately after my calling without consulting anyone around me. Okay? Next line. And without going up to Jerusalem to confer with those who were apostles long before I was, I got away to Arabia. You see that? There were apostles before him. That means, hey, hey, there were men in Jerusalem also who were born again. You see that? But they understood Jesus is the Messiah with also Judaistic lines of thought. He has a line of Damascus Christians who are believing some of whose also change a few routes from Jerusalem to Damascus. They also believe, but they have a little line of doctrine. Jesus is the son of God with a Judistic line and a few Hellenists. You understand? So these two are only different in one way or the other, but because the Jewish guys were older in the line than probably a few members. Even. You understand where I'm coming from? But you see, even when he has understood and he's among his brethren saying, Jesus is the son of the Lord, Jesus is the son of the Lord, Jesus is the son of the Lord, another revelation drops in the guy. And when the revelation comes, he says, I conferred not with flesh or blood. What did I do? Neither did I speak to those apostles that had gone ahead of me. What I did, I just retired in Arabia. He needed some time to say, God, I think there is something you're telling me. And I feel it's not connecting with what I know. Next line, 17. Uh-huh. It's Arabia, 17, okay? Uh -huh. I got away to Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus, okay? That means after being filled with this thing, he comes to where he had begun, and the conversion took place, and then he has laid hands. You see where I'm coming from? Next line. But it was three years before, so he spent three years in mm -hmm. Damascus, okay? He was goes up to Jerusalem to compare stories with Peter. Why is he seeking to compare stories? There's something in there that is, it's just not connecting. Okay, Peter has a line where they're born again and that's wonderful, but there's a judistic line that is providing too much for Moses. And the man has come with a certain message that is not parrying. So, can we compare notes to Peter? There's something I'm seeing that other brethren are not seeing. Next verse. He says, I was there for only what? 15 days. But what days they were? What is Paul saying? No grace, no, no, no law, no grace, no grace, no law. I swear, no, you see, you see the step 200, no grace, no, 15 days. Peter is trying to understand. I want to show you that certain men don't read the Bible. 15 days, he's with Peter, they're trying to compare notes, but I think this is this. No, 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 this is not one. 15 days. They still can't agree. Why? Because Paul has come with a message from Arabia. And he didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from John. He didn't get it from James. He didn't get it from anybody. But it's disturbing the guy's head. Let's continue. Uh -huh. Except for our master's brother James, I saw no other apostles. Why? I think when Peter had the message, Peter said, Ha! You know what? James is the chief apostle of the Jerusalem church. Talk to him about it. I think I understand you. I think I what? Understand you. I think I understand you. I think I get you. Talk to this guy about it. There is something. You see, can I give an example? Remember the time when Barnabas and Paul are commissioned to go and preach the gospel? Okay? Let me show you that this was a grace versus law. They go and start to preach. And in the middle there, there were also other brethren who had Paul and Barnabas preaching to the Gentiles, the untouchable riches of his glory. And then these guys have an issue of, he, he. when we hear Paul and Barnabas preaching, we hear them tell Christ under no condemnation, under no law. But there are things the law has been clear with us, even though we are born again. Judaism has taught us that even though we are born again, we must circumcise. I'm just giving you a sample. Okay? So we see lines of men trying to circumcise. 15. Let's begin with the first verse. 
Give them this version of that. He says, but there, it wasn't long before some Jews showed up from Judea, insisting that everyone must be circumcised. Okay? If you are not circumcised in the mosaic fashion, Judaism, you can't be saved. Or whatever guy. Eh? Next line. Mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet at once in a fierce protest. You see that? Already there, is, there are people who are born again, they know Jesus, they fear, but there are some guys here. A few of them who had believed later, but they still say, no, you can't be. Tell them, yes, salvation, Jesus died, mm, we can believe he came. But there is a mosaic line of circumcision, it's also what? So Paul and Barnabas already two wires. I'm just giving you a later experience, so you see how serious these things were. Okay? And they put up, the Bible says, Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet in fierce protest. And the church decided to resolve the matter by sending Paul, Barnabas, and a few others to put it before the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. That means Paul was in Judea preaching, okay? He was in Judea doing what? Preaching. Can I show you something? I think I'll just come to it. No, let's go there. Let's go back to Galatians. Let's go back to Galatians. I just want to join something, okay? Is that okay with you? Or you want this message of, Omwakakunogena Nami yesu wakena kubira ya kwenye nye ya muganda huu. Hakena kuwa msaja kubaka kubako. Ne wandiba ya sina jamuro kwa. Let's go back to where we were at. He saw no other apostle. Okay? Listen, listen. Shhh. It's the land here. He says he saw no other apostle. Next line. I'm telling you the absolute truth. This means they could have been men who doubted. Next line. Then I began my ministry. See. In the regions of Syria where he was raised, Cilicia, are you hearing me? After all that time and activity, are still unknown by the faith among the Christian churches in Judea. That means Judea was also a nice plot for him to go. He finishes Cilicia and all those places. At a particular point, he says, now let me also go to the guys. Eh? What does the next verse say? There was only this report that that man who once persecuted us is now preaching the very message he used to try to destroy us. Their response was to recognize and worship God because of me. Okay? You see that? You understand? So Judea has already had good news that Paul is what? Change. They are hungry to meet Paul. Preach in Silesia, preach anywhere in Syria, but we are hungry to see Paul. Now, see the experiences of the Pauls now go in Judea. Let's go back to where we were at. So he says, and leaders in Jerusalem, what, what happened? Battle started in Judea. They said no. Let us go back to Jerusalem. Because you know apostles who went before us, they're born again, they have Judaistic lines, and we feel there is something wrong here. You understand? Why? Because Paul and Barnabas have this feeling. Even though these guys might not understand this message, I spoke to Peter about it. Peter might not be too sure, but he has a clue with James. Those two guys, at least I spoke to them. Let's go back to the leaders. Okay? Let's go to the next line. After... They were sent off and on their way they told everyone they met as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria about the breakthrough, the Gentile outsiders, or to the Gentiles outsiders. Everyone who had the news cheered it up and was terrific. And it was terrific news, okay? Can, let's continue. When they got to Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas were graciously received by the whole church, including the apostles and leaders. They reported on their recent journey and how God had used them to open things up to the outsiders. They are testifying of the grace message to the people in the Gentile line. As I told people, I don't understand a Ugandan who doesn't understand the grace. Because, listen, grace grafted you in. You are not even meant to be a child of God. Next line. Some Pharisees, listen, stood up to say they are peace. They had become believers, but continued to hold to the hard party. They say, what was their line? You have to circumcise the pagan. Because I don't care how much Jesus is, we believe in Jesus. But you also must. Yeah, circumcision is also there. Yes, yes. Do you get the principle? Even though Jesus is what? You have to add on something, Brother George. You understand? Even though Jesus is there, hey, you also have to add on some things. You don't kill, don't. You add them on. That if, you, if you remove those things, salvation can't be complete. I had a man on radio who said, 
but a church without the Ten Commandments is not a church. I have to say. They substituted the Ten Commandments with Jesus. I thought they were going to say church without Jesus. But the man is saying a church without the Ten Commandments. It's not Ten Commandments, brother. Grace and truth came by Christ. The law came by Moses. But grace and truth came by Christ. On this rock shall I build my church. Church is Christ. Building. Not the law building. Are we together? I want to show you that some men don't read the Bible. Let's continue. Uh-huh. They saved their lives. Apostle. They lied. Uh-huh. They say you must make them keep the law. That means they were Gentiles who are getting born again. But Paul wasn't mentioning the law. You get it? He, he's preaching Christ that and resurrected, but he's not mentioning. Now, some men up to today, when you don't mention the law, they think you're saying, you're telling people to sleep around because if you're not the one, if you're not telling them to sleep around, how come you don't say don't sleep around? Because I understand the message. Let's continue. You're going to enjoy this. Uh-huh. Let's go. The apostles and leaders called a special meeting to consider the matter. Very serious. Tell your neighbor, very serious. The arguments went on and on. You see? Are you hearing me? Tell your neighbor, this is not new. The arguments what? Back and getting more and more. Now, when the arguments came up, I'm seeing Paul is saying, you did it, it's not at all. Grace. Hey, remember, this man got something from Arabia. The brethren in Jer- Jerusalem never understood it. He never received it from those guys. It is new and fresh from heaven. Man for every man. You understand? His lemma is in attracting numbers. He's giving testimony of how many Gentiles are getting filled in the church. Now, Paul says, ah, this thing is working. I love this. Oh, I love this. Now, listen. Listen. The arguments were heated. But Peter is remembering. This dude one time came and we sat and talked. We sat 15 days. But I think they were, they were serious days. But if Peter did not believe in this a bit, he would not have told the guy, can you tell this to James also? Peter told him, tell this to James, because he also realized it was interesting. If he didn't believe, he would just go to James and say, Waloka kau takaba muarebia. Baka bulirengiri katika fuse kaji. Kakarot, I love carrots. You get where I'm coming from. But you see the principle. See the principle. Peter stands up. He took the floor. He said, um, I don't know too much. Okay? He says, look at Peter's language. He says, friends, you know well that from early on God made it quite plain. That he wanted the pagans to hear the message of this good news and embrace it. And not in any second hand or roundabout way, but first hand straight from my mouth. You know that. I'm the one who opened the gospel to the house of Cornelius. But let's visit that line. Look, look at Peter's revelation. Okay? Next line. And God, who can't be fooled by any pretense on our part, but always knows a person's thoughts, gave them the Holy Spirit exactly as he gave them to us. I was speaking in the house of Cornelius. I, they had not obeyed the Ten Commandments. They didn't know the Ten Commandments don't steal. They didn't know Moses. But here I'm talking about God. And he gives them the Holy Spirit. Without, they were not even circumcised. But while I was speaking, the Spirit of God comes upon them. Brethren, there is something we are missing here. These men were not circumcised like some of you Gentile, I mean Jewish believers who still have a Judistic line. These men are not karik, I'm a sample. Maybe you're saying they have to be circumcised to be saved. But there's a group of folk I entered in. They were not circumcised. They didn't know the law of Moses. Yeah, I just spoke about the vision. And the anointing came upon them. Why did God accept them? Why did he give them tongues when they were not yet circumcised? If he gave them tongues when they were not yet circumcised, I think we're missing a bigger picture. Let's continue. He treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us, beginning at the very center of who they were and working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed. They didn't have the law, but he was cleaning them up. They did not don't steal, but he was cleaning them up. They were not under those things of Toyenda, but he was cleaning them up. 
That means there is a possibility of God cleaning up a man without the law. That's why when Paul later comes in this center of the grace, let's put the fifth group here, called the grace gospel. Are you hearing me? Paul's line, you understand? One, two, three, four. Five, the number represents the grace line here. You understand? Paul is saying, when sin, the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The law is killing us. But there are men who don't know anything, but they got it. He's, he's dealing with them. He's working from that center outward, cleaning up their lives as they trusted and believed. They just believed and trusted, and the guy worked out something. Let's continue. He says, so, why are you now trying to out God God? Asabatenga, say amen. Why are you trying to what? Loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors. Tell your neighbor, those things crash. The law crashes. Tell your neighbor, the law crashes. Now, how can you move in what crashed? How can you move in what crashed? Okay, let's continue. It crashed our ancestors. Yeah? Are you hearing me too? Next slide. Don't we believe that we are saved because of the master Jesus amazingly and out of the sheer generosity moved to save us just as he did to those from beyond our nation. So what are we arguing about? Where is this heated argument? Oh, okay. Now I'm thinking Paul is saying, man, Peter, you're the guy. Oh, yeah, we gambe. 15 days, this cost me nothing. I learned this in Arabia, baby. No man told it to me. And by the way, I don't share this because I've read it. It's the truth. Also, me, no man told me the grace. No man. Shut me down, boo. This is the grace message. I never read a book. I just stumbled on it. And men who stumble on it are crazy. You understand? Now, of course, we are going to create a certain void line of men who thought we had to first go to them to inquire. Let's continue. There was this dead silence. Oh, I almost saw guessing. Peter to put them. Religious guys are like Peter. You, we are with you here every day. We play ping pong together. We eat everything to oh, you sleep. No one said with the room quiet. Barnabas and Paul reported matter of fact on the miracles. You understand? They opened a battle. People were starting speaking. No second. After this guy is off and everyone is silent. Some men are trying to think about it. Now Paul comes in. They start to testify of the miracles. The cancerous tumors which left. You understand? And the wonders. And God has done among the other nations through their ministry. Okay? Next slide. The silence depends. You could what? James broke the silence. <laughs> you imagine, you imagine. The only two guys who had listened to Paul. That's why I told men, a man can only criticize Apostle Grace because he has not given me 15 days. If they do, they can't criticize. Do you realize that the men who gave Paul audience are the two guys playing game for him? James silenced them. He says, friends, listen. Mm -hmm. Simeon has told us the story. He has even not called him Peter. Simeon, but uh, he's my type. I call him I'm a certain man. Simeon has told us the story of how God at the very outset made sure that racial outsiders were included. Next slide. This is perfect agreement with the words of the prophet. After this, I'm coming back. I'll rebuild David's ruined house. I'll put all the pieces together again, and I'll make it look anew. He brought out prophecy. Next slide. So, outside as a seek, we what? So they'll have a place to? All the pagan peoples included in what I'm doing. God said it, and now he's doing it. It's not afterthought. He's always known he would do this. 
So here is my decision. We're not going to unnecessarily burden the non-Jewish people who turn to the master. Next line. We'll write to them a letter and tell them, be careful not to get involved in the activities connected with idols, to guide them of the moral of sex and marriage, to not to serve food offensive to the Jewish Christian blood, for the instance. Next slide. This is basic wisdom from Moses. Let's give them basic. Don't, don't go deep into the other line. Do you understand? Preached and honored for centuries. Now in city after city, as we have met and kept the Sabbath, everyone agreed. Apostles, leaders, and all the people, they picked Judas, nicknamed Basabbas, and Silas, and they both carried considerable weight in the church, and they sent them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Next slide. To do what? With this letter from the apostles and leaders, your friends, to our friends in Antioch, Syria and Cilicia. Hello. We heard that some men from our church went to you and said things that confused and upset you. Mind you, they have no authority from us. We did send them. <laughs> yeah. James Naregan. We did send men to put the law on you. Let's continue. We have agreed unanimously to pick representatives and send them to you with good friends Barnabas and Paul. We picked men we knew you could trust. Judas and Silas, they've looked death in the face time and again for the sake of Master Jesus Christ. Next slide. We've sent them to confirm in, fa in a face-to-face -face meeting with you what we have written. It seemed to the Holy Spirit and to us that you should not be saddled with any crushing burden, but be responsible only for this bare necessity. You understand? Be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols, avoid serving food offensive to Jewish Christians, blood instances, and guard the morality of sex and marriage. These guidelines are sufficient to keep relations congenial between us. So why were these guidelines there? Just to keep a good relationship with us. Because there's a way we understand marriage, don't abuse it, we might crash. Number two, there's a way we understand the way foods are served, don't do anything that goes out of the guidelines of our foods, respect our Sabbath, as in, provide for those things for us that won't stumble us. So, this guy is just looking for a place of don't stumble the Jewish guys. You have a freedom, but don't stumble them, please. So, this is not even James giving the law. He's just putting a few lines and places of relations for a particular memorandum of understanding. If indeed they are submitted to the church at Jerusalem. He didn't quote. <laughs> he knew why he meant that. Okay? Next line. And God be with you. And off they went to Antioch. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people were greatly what? <laughs> they gathered the church and read the letter. You can imagine. The people were greatly what? And what? <laughs> Judas and Silas, good preachers, both of them strengthened their new friends with many words of courage and hope. Next line. Is there any other line? Then it was time to go home. And they were set off by their new friends with laughter and embraces all around to report back to those who had sent them the message. Hallelujah. And a man cannot ask himself this question. Why did the Gentile church thrive and succeed up to today? It left there, went to Samaria, Syria, Judea, USA, South America, North America. The church in the Gentile church, up to today, the Gentile church has survived. The church in Jerusalem died. Because those men stayed legal. And some men who don't read this Bible are repeating the same mistake. What are they doing? They're killing church. You go to Jerusalem now. Judaism is still there. And there's no revival. Until the grace message hits Jerusalem, Christ won't be back. I promise you. Before the cross. Sing it. Gentiles, sing it. I have a strong purpose. My name is Quaver on his hand. My name is Reaper on his Come on, somebody. Why is heaven his hand? Come on, somebody. Come on, sing it. Next verse. 
When Satan tells me to despair and tells me all the guilt within, how what I knew can see the who made an end to all. You can't have seen. Made an end to all. Because of sin left in my sinful soul for God the child speaks at his fire to look on him and pass on me to look on him and pass Holy, behold him there, the reason lamp. Sing it. Thy perfect spotless righteousness. The great unchanging hope I am. Are you feeling what I'm feeling? I love the next line. Sing them with your heart. Bound with his power. My soul is My life is he. To Christ my Savior. I Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Gentile, you're free from crashing rules. You're free from crashing lines. You're free from the law. You're saved by grace. And as you believe on him, he'll perfect you inside out. Inside out without the law. Inside out without the law. Trust me, God will perfect you inside out without the law. That is why we were careful not to give you the law. And people are getting perfected inside out. Yes, there were weaknesses and they are. But God is perfecting you every day as you believe. For you've been saved by faith through grace or by grace through faith. Not of yourself that you should boast. It's entirely a gift of God and I'm sure that he that began a good work in you shall see to accomplishment to the day of Christ that is the author and the finish of your faith start to walk in that faith for that which is not done in faith is sin the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com you can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still feel free to join us every thursday for our weekly fellowship at uma multipurpose hall from 5 p.m to 8 p.m you can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero fenero make manifest